So, well. So bitter in the mouth. When I read bitter in the mouth, I sit at my desk, I go to the library, I mark up the book with my pencil and my markers and I try to write things in between the margins that are intelligent, but more often than not I'm writing some sort of stupid connection to an inside joke with my friends. When I read bitter in the mouth, I specifically connect to the fact that the main character is a woman or the southern atmosphere that the book has placed itself within even though I personally forget and don't even remember that North Carolina is part of the south. I guess it's a little bit of my bias of being near the coast there. Um, when I read Bitter in the Mouth, I don't connect to everything on a factual level, but at the same time there's just something so personal about the novel that speaks to me. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that when I read Bitter in the Mouth, I bring all of my identities to this novel. I bring my biases and my perspectives, but also this novel is bringing its own perspectives to me. What I just find so interesting is those kinds of ideas about how we interact with the world in the text, and thankfully, Manitrong explores that beautifully. And the thing is that Monique is not just presenting these ideas, she's asking these questions. How much control does one have over the formation of their own identity? What does it mean to be inside one's body? How willingly do we even share ourselves with one another? Chuang presents these questions about identities with a fair amount of nuance, and she does it through the main character of Linda Hamrick. Linda Hamrick, like every single person, has a huge multitude of identities that makes up her as a person. In the beginning of the novel, Linda lists these identities herself in the metaphor of an ordered line of playing cards. She says, My name is Linda Hamrick. I grew up in Boiling Springs, North Carolina. My parents were Thomas and Deanne. My best friend's name was Kelly. I was my father's tomboy. I was my mother's baton twirler. I was my high school's Val Victorian. I went far away for college and law school. I live now in New York City. I miss my great uncle Harper. But then using the metaphor of playing cards, Linda quickly distorts these facts. She says, I grew up in Thomas and Kelly. My parents were Val Victorian and baton twirler. My best friend was named Harper. I was my father's New York City. I was my mother's college and law school. I was my high school's tomboy. I went far away for Thomas and Deanne. I live now in Boiling Springs. I miss Linda Hamrick. The only way to sort out the truth is to pick up the cards again, slowly examining each one. Just as these facts themselves are jumbled and distorted, Linda herself recounts her life in a kaleidoscopic manner. Like how any human shifts the identities that they project between different settings, Linda shifts between childhood and teenagerdom with really little concern for chronologic order. She also peppers in these atemporal interpretations of famous North Carolinians, which is cool because she herself is from North Carolina, with reckless abandon. And essentially, she just trusts the audience to keep up with her. Likewise, the details of Linda's life drift in and out of focus. In one moment, we're focusing on clumsy first love and then the tenuous best friendship with Kelly, then unconditional love between family members to understood disdain between family members. These relationships and more work to build out the flesh and the world that is Linda Hamrick and the novel Bitter in the Mouth. But that is not the only thing that Linda has going for her. She also has plenty of secrets that Truong threads throughout the novel, and sometimes the reader herself doesn't know it, but these secrets work to interact with Linda personally, with the reader, to interact with the world of the characters, which helps build upon the theme of identity building. For instance, Linda Hamrick has synesthesia of the lexical gustatory variety. She can taste words. Often the English language tastes like southern foodstuffs, which Truong helps to communicate through italics connected to each word that she hears. Besides being a choice on Truong's part to just make the prose more engaging, which it does, that's why it's such a popular choice in modern fiction. I mean, imagine how flavorful your imagery can become whenever you're literally connecting two senses together. Linda also 
has her synesthesia really connect to the theme and the obsession in the novel with physicality and the mind, how that builds upon identity, how that helps you interact with the world. Because by giving Linda this disability, this condition, Linda cannot extricate her self-conception from the senses. Whereas a neurotypical person thinks of taste and touch and any other of the five senses as just something that's normal to you, this is something unique. Words themselves, the devices that we use to understand the world around us and to define ourselves, create sensations that are forced upon Linda. It's the physical and cerebral made simultaneous, a mythic occurrence throughout Bitter in the Mouth. In the novel, disappointment makes it so that skin is on fire. Sexual intimacy makes characters feel as if they have someone else inside of us, and that person did and said things we failed to understand the motives for. And the thing is that these, this binary motif rarely occurs voluntarily. Instead, Linda and the other characters in this novel really only have the autonomy to react to these identity-shaping circumstances in their lives. So clearly, Chong expertly weaves in this theme and motif of identity building within Bitter in the Mouth, connecting it not only to just our self-conceptions as a person, but how they are built and how humans influence one another. To fully demonstrate these ideas, however, Truong subjects her characters to a high volume of trauma, and it can honestly be emotionally taxing for readers at times. You know, in real life, people rarely get to fully heal from the traumas or address them. You know, you don't get to talk to all the people that subjected you to that hurt. And in the novel, Truong does go for a sense of realism, and by extent, um, it can be kind of hard to as a reader go through it because there isn't a full amount of closure at times that you might want. At best, the reader might at times get an explanation from another character as to why they hurt somebody or a reaction, some sort of sign that they're on a pathway to healing, but at the same time, quite often, more tragedy keeps on getting heaped onto the plates of these characters. <sighs> she also takes steps to find closure with the pieces of her life that she can still address. By the end of the novel, Linda might not be happy with the amalgamation that creates Linda Hamrick, but she's on a path to reaching peace. Similarly, other characters that Linda previously understood through a more two-dimensional lens become more fully fleshed out, although at times these leaps in characterization can lack the full explanation or logic that justifies their changes, but it still demonstrates how we as humans are fully multidimensional and complex. And though she never really denied it, Linda comes to fully recognize how people influence one another with their identities and rub off on each other, just as how they have done to her with her own personal experience, such as how she notices people adopting the laughter of her best friend or the laughter of her uncle, even whenever like it's specifically a trait attributed to th those characters. And when those instances occur, they're beautiful, not harmful, like, the other instances of failed autonomy here. Okay, so in life, we don't get to choose how people invade our psyche and try on our skin. We don't even have the power to select the people that do that to us. Likewise, we have little agency over who we personally influence. But as Truong understands and communicates through Linda, this identity sharing is not a negative thing automatically. It's neutral and it can be turned positive. I mean, there's something beautiful about how I absorbed my grandmother's penchant for tea after so many years or how Linda adopted the perfume of her loved ones. Truthfully, the human endeavor, capital H, capital E, is terrifying and delightful. Within it, we're all just desperately trying to be understood. And though we might not be able to fully empathize with one another in the way that we desire, this form of identity sharing takes us one step closer to that understanding. This world is so divided and broken and unequal, Trong illustrates how connection can possibly be the saving grace to enduring all of that and perhaps improving it. Overall, 
Chong wonderfully explores the tensions between our identities as individuals and our identities within the human collective. However, Chong's concern with themes and tension can also leave the novel wanting in terms of the narrative logic for characters' endings and the emotional catharsis for many conflicts, for the many conflicts, triumphs, and travities bitter surveys. Still, reality rarely reflects the emotional closure that fiction can provide. And as Strong does appear to be aiming for a form of realism, Bitter's lacking areas make sense while perhaps leaving the reader wanting more. All I know is that I thoroughly enjoyed the novel and criticisms aside, I think I definitely gained a lot from reading it and I would highly recommend it to anybody else.